What do you imagine heaven will be like? Just think about that for a second. What do you imagine heaven will be like? It's not often that Christians will just relate to our own circumspection. What do you imagine to be true? Well, we know that our imaginations is not necessarily what makes reality, but we also know that when we look in the Bible, asking questions about what will heaven look like, well, I actually do think there's a lot there. There are still many questions that remain. One of the uh, pretty regular exercises in the Sanford household during our, our worship time at the end of the night's is uh, just talk about the Bible verses that I've read through that night. We, we sing some songs together, and uh, I'll oftentimes get my kids asking questions about heaven. Man, they ask the best questions about heaven. They ask those questions that I'm, I'm sitting there, I, 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 I don't know, I have no idea. That one of their favorite questions, I've said this before, they like to ask, how old will we be in heaven? I don't know. <laughs> they, they ask, uh, Daddy, will you be bald in heaven? I think all men will be bald in heaven. <laughs> um, ask, will there be pets in heaven? Will there be animals in heaven? More important to me, will I be able to eat animals in heaven? <laughs> I think. There's a lot of questions like this. What kind of preferences might exist? You ever thought of that one? This, is, this has been on my mind recently. What kind of preferences could exist? If preferences exist in heaven, which I assume, admit, I assume they'll be there, and like for right now, I don't, I prefer bacon. I don't prefer zucchini. Will I ever have to eat zucchini in heaven? Right? You get the idea? Uh, will some people like to wear certain colors and others not like to wear those? Will some people prefer to worship God while hiking on a mountain while others will prefer to do it on the beach? You get the lines of questioning that come from preference? Will we be able to recognize each other? Or will I run into someone and be like, hey, I, I think I know you. Do, do you remember me? I, I, I lived in the 20 and 21st centuries in, in America. Do, do we, you know, are you going to do that? Or are you going to have a perfect memory? Are you going to run right up onto somebody? And you're going to know everything that you ever had in a relationship with that person. How much are we going to remember our sins? Is that that? I don't want to remember my sins. I remember my sins and I get sad. Can we do that in heaven? If not, how could we be forever worshiping and praising Jesus for having paid for those sins, right? You see these questions? We get some answers. We're not left with nothing. Lots of questions might come up. Now, I suspect that I'm not the one unique guy in history who asks these questions. I don't think it's just the Sanford family who asks them. I suppose that all of you have had those kinds of questions before. And I suppose strongly suspect that even in the Old Testament day, people were asking those same questions. Actually, little Hebrew kids were asking when they were wandering in the wilderness and saw nothing but sand and manna, Daddy, will we have to eat manna in heaven? Will there be sand there in the afterlife? However they might talk about that. I suspect that they would have probing and insightful questions just as we do today. You know, many people, many scholars even today, have said that the Old Testament includes little to nothing about the afterlife. I strongly disagree with that sentiment. Actually, that typically comes from especially modern-day Jewish scholars. It is true that we've been given more revelation today than the believers in the Old Testament. That's true. That's under a doctrine we would call progressive revelation. And all that means is that as God progressively reveals more and more about himself and his plan throughout history, the people will have access to more and more data. So if you were to ask a person, one generation before Moses lived, what are 10 things that God would command you to do or not to do? They probably would not come up with the exact 10 commandments in that order, right? But if you were to ask somebody a generation after Moses, what are 10 moral commands of God? They'd probably give you the 10 commandments word for word. If you were to ask somebody a generation before Jesus came, what will be the name of the Messiah? They wouldn't know but you and I do. All revelation must necessarily agree with previous revelation. But it is true that some will know more than others as we grow throughout the age until the end of the writing of the New Testament. One year as I was reading through the Bible, 
I, uh, I kind of did my annual Bible plan and I grabbed the green highlighter and I said, listen, as I go through, I said this to myself, I guess, uh, as I go through the Old Testament, I'm going to highlight green every single sentence that I find that makes a reference to heaven, the end, afterlife, any, even a veiled reference and I was amazed when I was done how much the old, how many green marks are all over my Old Testament right now. In fact, the, the highest concentration is probably in the book of Psalms. David talked about the afterlife all the time. It's hard to find a psalm that he didn't make some mention of the afterlife. David believed that even after death, he, as a believer, would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He prayed that God would set him in his presence forever. He believed that he would be received into glory. Those are his words. And that he would glorify God's name forever. In contrast, he said of those who were not faithful, those who did not love God, David said that they would be cast down into the pit of destruction. He called it Sheol. They were away from the land of the living, into the depths of the earth, separated from the presence of God. He even said that those who, direct quote here, hate the Lord would cringe toward him and their fate would last forever. So the Old Testament God followers did believe that in death there would be, one, eternal joy in the presence of God forever for the faithful, and two, eternal suffering and separation from God for the unfaithful. Does that sound familiar? It should. Because that's what we see the New Testament teach about the end as well. The Old Testament believer expected much the same that we expect today. But there was something different about the experience of the Old Testament saint who died than there will be today for you and I if we believe and die. I want to show you why that is and what that is in our text today. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, please open those with me. I'm going to put the, the, the particular text that we're going through on the screen so you'll see them. But Hebrews 9, 23 through 28. In a moment, I'm going to read through these, pray, and then uh, we're going to walk back through them a verse or so at a time. The author in this passage draws our attention to heaven. Both the first verse 23 and the last verse 28, he's again pointing us skyward, pointing our attention to heaven. And I think that there is one big point being made in the text today. And that point is that Christ's sacrifice on the cross for our sins was better than the old covenant sacrifices and it accomplished what those never could have uh, that's kind of the same point that we've been making for the past handful of weeks because that's what chapters of this book of the New Testament, this book called Hebrews, tells us. That Jesus, the new covenant, all of these things are better than the old covenant. God used to, before Jesus, relate to people on earth in a certain way, under a certain set of conditions, promises between God and people. And today, because of Jesus, he relates to us different. Same unchanging God, new relational standard. The Holy Spirit, though, inspired the author of this text to not just make that point, but to surround that point with a bunch of statements that are just too good to pass up. We're going to have to pause and take a look at a few of those as we move through today, okay? And we're going to see how far we get in our time. Let's read Hebrews 9, verses 23 through 28. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these for Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world." But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Let's pray. 
Lord, as we look at this passage today, we are snagging a single paragraph out of this entire gigantic, thick, ancient book. And we're asking for you to help us as we look at this singular paragraph to to put it in place of all the rest that's going on and to understand it rightly, to take it in context, to see what you intended to tell us with this important paragraph. Lord, there's a reason you stuck this in here. And if it wasn't in here, we'd miss something or, or we might not have it confirmed as much as we need it. So we pray that you would help us to see clearly what you said, not just that our knowledge about the Bible or our knowledge about you would grow, but that our love for you and for others would grow as well. And so we ask for that miracle to happen as we read through your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Back to verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So you'll notice we, we're right now picking up in the middle of a flow of thought. The author has just previously written about the rites, that is the rituals, the ceremonies that the, uh, the priesthood of the Old Testament had to do. They have to kill blood, uh, kill uh, goats and bulls and take blood and they have to sprinkle it on the artifacts, the, the furnishings of the temple back in those days in order to purify those things. And, and so that was necessary. It was necessary to purify the things that have been tainted by the sinfulness of mankind, of the world, and actually more so to, to purify the people in coming before God in those things. So that God used to relate to people in that old covenant with those things. He calls them the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with that kind of sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, a priest killing a lamb, a goat or a bull, and using that blood to appease God's anger. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. I want you to think about this for a second. He's again comparing the new covenant with the old He's saying that the better covenant required a better sacrifice. So for God to institute a new promise between himself and people, the blood of goats and bulls would not work. He needed something that was more valuable than that, more permanent, infinite. And that alone is the blood of Jesus. The better covenant required a better sacrifice. The permanent covenant required a permanent sacrifice. And look at how he says this here. But those things were to be purified with those rites, these rites in the Old Testament, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. That means he's saying that the earthly things were purified and so were the heavenly things. So question for you. Why did Jesus need to purify the heavenly things? What was it about the heavenly things that needed to be purified? Make no mistake about what we're saying here. Jesus died on the cross for the sins of all of those who will ever believe in him. And he went to heaven upon that death. When he died, he went to stand before his father in heaven. And as he stands before his father in heaven, he goes before him as a high priest into the eternal heavenly temple. So the earthly temple that was down here in the Old Old Testament days before it was destroyed and wiped off the earth in 70 AD by the Roman army. That temple was a, was a copy, a pattern of the heavenly one. There was a heavenly reality upon which all the earthly patterns were made. Jesus entered into that heavenly place. That's what he did. And when he went there, he brought his own blood, establishing a new covenant, a permanent sacrifice. And what did he do it for? To purify the heavenly things. So again, the question is, why did Jesus need to purify anything in heaven? Is this saying that something in heaven was impure, was tainted by sin. Why do they need to purify the heavenly things? Because you and I, even after we died, could not enter into the presence of God for eternity until our sins had been eternally cleansed. It was not the heavenly temple that was impure, but the people who had not yet been fully and eternally cleansed cleansed. I want you to follow where I'm going with this and what I mean by it. A few weeks ago, I asked you to imagine a young Jewish child living in the Old Covenant who maybe would get out out of his tent in the morning and look and see, Daddy, what's that big giant tent in the middle of all of ours? Well, that's the tabernacle, son. 
What's it for? That's where God resides. That's his throne on earth. Well, can I go in there? No! You may not go in there. Well, I want to be close to God. But you're a sinner and you may not get close to God. Well, when I get older, can I? No! Right, I'm being emphatic for a reason, making the point, right? You, you following it? The idea is that that was a symbol of separation between God and his people. That's what temples are. Can you imagine, though, for someone in that situation, seeing the temple, seeing, wow, that's the separation point, dying and finding that even in death, a separation remains? Now, this might seem silly to imagine, being in heaven, but not yet experiencing full unobstructed access to God. But for the believing Jew under the Old Testament, that is what they would experience. In other words, something dramatic changed for the experience of the Old Testament believer who had died and was in the heavenly places the moment that Jesus died. There are some things that we know about the experience of the Old Testament saint after he or she dies that we get in the Bible. First, it's not properly referred to as heaven. The Old Testament doesn't refer to the place that people go after they die, if they're faithful, as heaven. Quite the same. Perhaps the best term we have for what it could be called, Jesus refers to it in Luke 16. See, Jesus gives this story about a rich man and a poor man. Rich man and poor man's name is Lazarus. Uh, and and, and, and the, what's implied here is that the rich man did not love God. Lazarus, who was poor, did love God. That's the idea. And so when both of them die, irrespective of how good they had it on this life, that's the point, Lazarus, being faithful, goes to be in paradise, and uh, the rich man goes to suffering. And so what happens is Jesus says that when Lazarus dies, the angels carried him to Abraham's side, or Abraham's bosom is actually what the Greek term means there. So that might be the term we could use, Abraham's side. That's where they would have gone in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant. They had died prior to Jesus' sacrifice. Their experience would have been there with Abraham. Now, let me kind of break this down a little bit more because the number of Old Testament and few, few New Testament texts that help us understand what that would have looked like tell us that this is what the experience would have been. It would have been a sinless state. It would have been disembodied. That means that when a person dies, the body gets buried in the ground and the soul goes up to be with the Lord. At least in some way, they were not yet in a glorified body, just like we'd say about us today. When we die, our bodies get buried and our soul goes to be with the Lord. It would be called a place of rest. As we see Samuel, who's conjured up by the witch at Endor, he says, you've disturbed me from my rest. They would have been in the presence of other Old Testament saints, like Abraham right here. Uh, Moses and Elijah apparently were hanging out together when they appeared again at the Mount of Transfiguration. Comfort is offered there, Jesus says that in Luke 16. It would have been a place of peace, like David says. It would have been a place where they'd be giving glory to God. It would have been paradisical. That's how you could say it. It would be like, like a paradise. And we would expect the same for us. Nothing that I've said right there so far looks different than what we would expect today if we died. But there is something different. It also seems to be a place where those residing there were not yet enjoying the full and unmitigated presence of God. Why? Well, in other words, by the grace of God, through their faith in him, they were brought to heavenly paradise, but that paradise was not yet complete. They were waiting for something to happen. Now, you might be thinking this. If you're like me, think skeptically when you get to these passages, read this in the text, you go, wait a minute. You might say, Rich, there's no time in heaven. It's a timeless place. So the Old Testament believer who passed away a thousand years before Jesus, let's say, gets to immediately experience all the good things as though Jesus had already died. But that's not the way that the Bible talks about time in heaven. In fact, the New Testament tells us repeatedly that there is time experience for those in heaven. It even says things like fruit, uh, uh, trees will give fruit in their season, month after month after month. Days and nights are counted. Years are counted in some way. In fact, God, in comforting the martyrs in Revelation chapter 6, when they cry out to him, they say, God, how much longer, it's time, how much longer must we wait until you bring this to conclusion? You bring judgment on the world and you finish this thing. And God doesn't go, well, there's no time. You're already there. God says, you must wait a little longer. 
course they experience time. The saints in this age now who passed away, if you have a brother or sister, a friend, loved one, believer in Jesus Christ who dies, what's, what's their experience now? Their body goes into the ground, their soul gets to be with the Lord, but they are waiting until another time, aren't they? They are waiting until a time where Christ makes all things new. He brings judgment on the world, rescues those whom he loves, glorified bodies for those who are in the heavens. The saints in this age are waiting for Jesus' second coming, just like the saints of the previous age were waiting for Jesus' first coming. So why couldn't the Old Testament saints who died yet enjoy full, full access to the presence of God? Simple and obvious answer. Because their sins had not yet been paid for. If a person could experience all the lasting and eternal benefits of heaven without Jesus having died on the cross, then he would not have had to go in the first place. So the, so the Old Testament saints, when they died, they're not hanging out in this eternal bliss, everything already finished, so that someone comes up someday and goes, hey, did you hear a week ago Jesus died on the cross? Oh, really? Well, that's interesting. No. Something dramatic would have changed in the heavenlies when Jesus entered in to offer himself up as a sacrifice for the people. I want to read to you from a Hebrews commentary by Gareth Cockrell. It says this about this exact idea. The old covenant people's sins formed a barrier that prevented them from coming into God's presence and exposed them to his wrath. If sin erected a barrier forbidding entrance into the sanctuary that was the pattern, how much more did it bar the way into the true sanctuary in which God dwells? Thus, by cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, Christ removed this otherwise impregnable barrier and the accompanying threat of judgment. Perhaps we could say that at Jesus' death, the temple curtain was torn in two, both in Jerusalem and in heaven. You remember that event? Matthew 27, as Jesus dies, hanging on the cross, breathes his last. It is finished. He's dead. At the moment that happens, there's an earthquake in Jerusalem and the veil, the curtain that separated the most holy place from the people of God because of their sins was torn in two, supernaturally, torn in two from top to bottom. The saving benefits of Jesus' atonement at that point were retroactively applied to the Old Testament saints. I want to show you, the text says this as well in Hebrews 11. We'll be here in the flow and just... A few months, I suppose. Hebrews eleven thirty nine. Look at this. And all these, talking about a list of faithful saints who died before Jesus came. All these faithful saints, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Why? Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. See that? Something happened in heaven at the cross. This means that when Jesus was hanging on the cross and when he was dying, and the believers in that day, his disciples, who watched him hang on the cross, watched him breathe his last, what were they? Were they celebrating? They were weeping. They didn't understand. They were crying. They saw this terrible event. And for them, mourning amongst those who followed Jesus, a scattering of the people who followed Jesus. In heaven, there was celebration. Because at that moment... Jesus entered into the heavenly temple as a high priest on our behalf. From that point forward, giving us unobstructed access to his father. I want you to try to get your head around just how big the event of the cross actually was. How eternal it was. How all the people before Jesus were looking forward to to this event, and all of us now, because it's past, we look back to this event, how significant that this is, eternal and infinite. Look what it says about his entrance. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Sometimes my Mormon neighbors are surprised to hear that Jesus never went into the temple on earth. No one did, other than the priests who were in the line of Aaron and the high priest who could go once a year into the singular room in the back, the most holy place, to bring an atoning sacrifice. He never could enter in. 
but he has entered not into the physical earthly temple. Those are copies of the ones in heaven, the things in heaven. But he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. To appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Jesus is for us. You and I deserve judgment for our sins. You know, preachers from my ilk, those who call themselves reformed guys, love the Bible. Love, one of the things we're really good at is hammering on the sinfulness of humanity. We love telling you how terrible you are. We love waking up in the morning and thinking about how I'm a worm. I am not deserving of anything good in all eternity. I am deserving of the wrath of an almighty, all-holy God forever and ever. I deserve nothing greater than hell for all of my deeds. And so do you. All of you do. You are all, as I am, guilty of high treason before a perfect king. And our crimes are to be held eternally accountable. We are to not only suffer for our crime of not loving God yesterday and today and tomorrow, but we should suffer eternally because every day we do not love God in hell. Every day in hell, if we were to live there, that we did not love God perfectly then, we are deserving of yet another day of judgment. That's how eternity works. You ever heard that? People ask, like, how, how can hell be eternal? It doesn't make any sense. Of course it makes sense because your wickedness accrues. If you were a prisoner and you were put in prison for burning down someone's house and you had 15 years you had to do in time there, and while you're there, you committed murder, they're going to tack that on. You don't get out in 15 now. You now have that plus your crimes you committed in prison. You can continue and will forever in eternity continue to sin against God in hell and therefore have to suffer judgment forever. That's why it's eternal. It's not only against an eternal God, your sins, your crimes, but you continually have those accrue. You and I deserve that fate, hell, separation from God, suffering for all of eternity. Reform guys, we're, we're good about talking about that, okay? We need to not neglect how for us our Jesus is. Let, ne never let the emphasis on how undeserving we are overshadow the overwhelming, exceptional, amazing love of God. God demonstrated his great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ did that. He died on a cross and he appeared in the presence of God on our behalf. He went there for us. He stood before God for us. John 3.18 says this, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You get that? You believe in the name of the only Son of God, you are not condemned. You do not have any condemnation stick to you. Romans 8, 1 through 2 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Christ appears on our behalf. God is not against you. He doesn't have it out for you, fellow brother or sister in Christ. His care and his love for you is as genuine and as real as his love for his son. You ever feel like God is just waiting for you to mess up? I, I, I spend time with especially Christian brothers all the time who struggle with a whole variety of different issues and sins and concerns. And it's so common so common for believers to have this image of God just waiting with the hammer. They just, just do it, do it, do it. Just winding up for punishment for us. Just, you know, we, we live in crazy times. You look around the world, you see just how nutty it is. You, you, you see the elections. This is, a, this is a weird time, isn't it? But God is not so busy with the world that he doesn't notice you. You're not just the collateral damage that takes place during his plans for more important things. Like he's rushing into battle into the world, working out all things in history for his glory, and oh, he's just trampling on you in the way. Oh, sorry, guys. This means that whatever happens in 2021 and beyond will be for your good because Christ is there appearing in the presence of God on our behalf. In fact, the New Testament picture is not that he's standing there every day doing this over and over, but that that work is so completed, he's now seating, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. 
and that we are seated in him. That work, that, that, uh, that mediating work like that is there in the person of Jesus, yet the work is complete. He doesn't have to choose between doing good for you or working out history for higher purposes. You get that? Man, I want that to be an encouragement to believers. I want that to be an encouragement so that when you wake up the morning after the election, no matter what happens, because I actually do think this is a pretty decisive election. I don't usually get onto hyperbolic rhetoric like this, but I actually do think that this is probably the most important election of my lifetime, at least, and maybe a couple of lifetimes, very likely, in America. But at the end of the day, God is in control of this. And you and I are going to wake up in exactly the world that he wanted you to be in. You get that? It's not spinning wildly out of his control and he's going, oh man, this is going to go really bad for you believers. I'm so sorry about all that. Guys, we're here for a reason exactly at this time. And he is there for our good. Good for us in these next years. So many times I talk to my brothers and sisters in Christ and they, they get shamed by their sin. Which is right. We should be ashamed of our sin. We should hate our sin. We should hate our sin more than anybody else's sin. No sin is higher priority for you than the one you committed today. Not everybody else's sin and the bad things that guy did or that guy did, but you. We should hate our sin. And the shame and guilt that comes with that should remind us of the gospel, remind us of this good news that Jesus appeared in the presence of God on your behalf. When you sin today, you have a high priest who's there for you. God is for you. It's not the winding up to give you that judgment that's been laid out on his son, Jesus. I want to read for you Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. Check this out. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You hear that? So the picture is not God winding up, can't wait to bring judgment on us. That judgment has come on his son Jesus. He was winding up for millennia prior to Jesus coming. And the punishment due to us went on to his son. The winding up that God has for us now is preparing to unload the immeasurable riches of his grace for all eternity. That's what we get. That's what he's preparing to unload on us. Man, oh man, this is going to be a forever encouragement and conversation for believers to have the right relationship between works and faith in your mind. Sin is awful and it's wicked it's deadly it's painful it's terrible and that's why jesus died and that's why he stood before his father on our behalf as a high priest making it so we can have unobstructed access to god we will be in his presence forever if we believe in him god is for you nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own Real quick on that. The high priest went in every year. Why? Because the people kept sinning. That's why. It's really easy. The second he comes out of the most holy place on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, he comes out of there, sins have already been committed. <laughs> the second he walks back out, he's going he's to have to go back in. And that day is provided one day in that year, and he's supposed to go back in again for the sins of the people. He had to do it repeat. That was the plan. It wasn't like a set up one time and they were just surprised. Like, oh my goodness, again? I have to do this again this year? That was the plan. It was built into their calendar because it was absolutely certain that they were going to have sins that needed atoning. And so the high priest in the Old Testament offered himself repeatedly. But Jesus didn't go into a physical temple. He didn't go into the Old Covenant temple. He went into the New Covenant temple, the heavenly temple, the perfect, eternal, final, permanent temple, and he didn't go in there so that he'd have to go in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out every year until the end of time. In fact, the, look at the way that the, the author says this here in this kind of in this interesting uh, uh, kind of parable. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. That's how many sins there are. That's how many sinners there are. 
Literally, from day one, that's all Jesus would have been doing. If the new covenant sacrifice was one that could be repeated, that's all he'd be doing. Die, die, die. That'd be the way that it goes down. But he makes the point that the effect of Jesus' sacrifice is perpetual. He didn't go into the physical temple in Jerusalem like the high priest in the old covenant. And he does not offer sacrifices repeatedly like they did either. Again, we see that the new covenant sacrifice does not work like the old covenant sacrifice. I tried to, I tried to show you the author is making this central point over and over and over. The new covenant is better beyond the old covenant. It's not the same. The old covenant's obsolete, dead, gone. This is a new one. He says this phrase, at the end of the ages. But as it is, he, Jesus, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. A couple notes here. End of the ages. Jesus came at the end of the ages. Sometimes it's good for us to remember that ages of human history have played out over centuries and even millennia before you and I were born into this world. Man, the study of history should be humbling to think about how small we are, how finite we are, how much more has been out there for thousands of years before we ever were a twinkle in our parents' eye. But Jesus stepped into history to offer himself for the sins of the world in order to, last sentence here, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This is how it works. He puts away sin. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, your sin has been put away. In other words, if you sin tomorrow, Jesus doesn't need to get back up and go die again and enter back into the heavenly temple again. Oh, man, I thought everything was good. Then Rich did that thing. (sighs) Gets up off the throne, marches back out, dies again, comes back in. You see that? You see that's the point? You see how much the author's trying to make that clear? Listen, it used to have to be that way. That's not the way it goes anymore. Once and for all sacrifice of the son. The next chapter, he's going to hammer this even more. So we'll see the repeated nature of the old covenant in contrast with the once and for all of the new covenant. But here he makes that clear to us so we can't get out of that. We can't think that when we sin again, we need yet another sacrifice in order to deal with that. Jesus' death on the cross pays for all sins of those who believe in him. All of them, past, present, and future. We have an all omniscient God. That means before Jesus got on the cross, before the foundation of the world, he knew all of the sins that you would ever commit in your entire lifetime. The ones that surprise you, the ones that surprise your spouse, The ones that surprise your neighbor or brother or whatever, the ones that surprise the other people in your life, they don't surprise God. Jesus is just like, yeah, I died for that. But Jesus, what about that next one? I died for that too. And the one I'm not telling you about what you're going to do tomorrow, I died for that. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Your relationship to sin as a believer is entirely different than your relationship to sin before you were saved. Sin is sin. Sin is bad. But it used to be the thing that kept you out of heaven. Now it is the thing that reminds you of the grace of God in spite of that sin. This is why Christians are to pursue maximal holiness. This is why we should hate sin and battle it for the rest of our lives. Because we have victory secured. Because that sin has been put away by the sacrifice of himself. You think you're strong enough to manage your own sin if this isn't true of it? Because that sin has been put away by Christ's sacrifice, you can attack it. You can have victory over that, and you ought to seek it. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once, to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Lots of phrases there we need to look at. It is appointed for man to die once, 
And after that comes judgment. Die once, judgment. That's how it works. Simply put, there are no second chances. The Bible does not give that to you. There are no second chances. You die, and whatever happened during that lifetime, you either loved God, believed in him, repented of your sins, and turned faith in Jesus, or you didn't. Those are the options. And wherever you stand with God when you die is where you will stand for the rest of eternity. There are no second chances. This is why as Christians we feel so urgent about sharing the gospel. There would be no urgency to share the gospel if everyone will have another chance later. What's the point of that? Have you ever wondered that? There are lots of religions in the world that try to twist words like this that are super clear. Men die once and then they get judged. That's how it works. You die and you get judged. So what is the motivation for a religion that still sends missionaries when there's second chances? The answer is self-serving motivations. That's what. If it'll be dealt with perfectly in the end, wait for them. But if you get some benefit for doing it, then go. Do you see the difference then between the Christian missionary who gives his or her life to share the urgent message of the gospel that those who hear it may believe, confess the Lord Jesus and be saved? You see the difference in the motivation of those who say, this is it. This is your only chance. You have to hear this. You could die tomorrow. You see the difference there when the person goes, you can do this after you're dead. And there will be people who will tell you way better, way, way stronger arguments. Jesus himself might be part of that in some way. You'll, you'll clearly see things in a way that will make it more evident for you. Well, then why should I do that now? Well, because I get benefit. Our motivation for the lost person is compelled by our love for God and for others. That's why we share the gospel, because there isn't another time. There isn't another way for this to work out. I've had people challenge us before, just the logic of it. These texts are clear, we see in the Bible. You die and you get judged, okay? There's a, there's a storing for judgment. The New Testament says in a handful of occasions for those who die apart from Christ. You are judged according to your works if you don't have faith in Jesus. That's the way that it works out. I've had people say, like, well, why wouldn't this person change their mind after they die? Let's consider the non-believer for a second. Non-believer dies. What's their experience now? Do they get the grace of God in death? No. They don't get the grace of God in death. They're now separated from the presence of God. They don't get that common grace of God that all of humanity gets, which means that any inhibition that had been offered by God generally because they were image bearers of him is gone. All of the hatred they have in their heart can now be completely directed towards aimed at God. That's how it works. Any hatred of God that exists in the heart of a person will amplify when they die, not subside. I've heard it said before, and I think this is accurate theologically, that if you were to kick open the gates of hell and, and cry out to the souls that are there and say, if you want to love and worship God for eternity, come out, no one would leave. I think that's true. They go to, God, they go to hell because they hate God. And sometimes that hatred is not purely seen here on this earth when we're under God's common grace. But that goes away when the person is separated from him in his presence in hell under judgment. He will appear a second time. Jesus will only appear one more time. Look at that. that. He will appear a second time. A second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So let me just kind of wrap this point up here, but hopefully it's helpful for you. There will not be a secret coming and a public coming. This is a, this is a pretty common view that's held today. It's probably the majority view of Christians today. No one held this prior to 1850, but a lot of Christians today hold this, that there will be a secret rapture. Jesus comes that time secretly to take one group of the people of God, and then he'll come another time, a second second coming, a third coming, to take another people of God, distinctive people of God. I think the Bible says this. He's going to come one time to deal with sins and a second time to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. That's what he's going to do. There's only two comings of Jesus, the first and the second. The first happened at his birth. We celebrate it as Christmas. 
The second will come in judgment. And when he comes, it will not to be to bear the burden of sins. That's done. So he's not like, man, I got to catch up on all these, all these sins that weren't dealt with last time. That's finished. It's perfectly and purely done. That's what the whole flow of this text has been, right? That once and for all, not repeated, finished sacrifice is done. So when he comes the next time, that's already finished. He comes to conclude world history. When Jesus comes next, it'll be for the judgment of those who hate him and for the rescue of those who love him. One more coming. Save those eagerly waiting for him. Those who eagerly wait for him. We should be eagerly waiting for Jesus. I'm amazed at how many verses in the Bible tell us this. Look to Jesus. Keep your eyes on heaven. Fix your eyes, your gaze, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Not on earthly things, but in heaven. I want to read just a few of these kinds of verses. That, 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 that's Colossians 3. Here's a few other ones. Philippians 3.20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 is, is a, a, a celebration of the fact that the Thessalonians were faithful believers. And it says that this, this is one of the things that they do. Wait for his son, God's son, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Paul says that he prays for the Christians at Corinth so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have dozens of New Testament commands to wait or, or um, saying how people are being um, uh, acknowledged as doing good for their waiting for the revealing of Jesus. This is why Jesus gives all of his parables in places like Matthew 25 that tell us that we are to be eagerly waiting for the bridegroom coming. D don't get distracted by other worldly things and forget. In fact, he warns us, don't do that. You don't want to miss the coming but that he means he doesn't want us to just forsake the mission, the great commission been given to us until he returns. Be busy doing that. That's how we eagerly wait for him. Brothers and sisters, we are not to be the bomb shelter Christians who dig deep down into the ground like a mole and wait it out until he comes to rapture us out of this earth. That's not eagerly waiting for him. Likewise, we're not to build cruise ships for, for that kind of country club style Christianity to make it as comfortable for ourselves as we can until he returns. Our eager waiting for Jesus is what the rest of the book of Hebrews is encouraging the Christians to do, to suffer for the name of Jesus as we wait for him to come. That's the whole way the New Testament commands us to be eager in our waiting. My prayer is that as believers, we be those who stay busy with the great commission of God, that we want to leverage every moment of our life in our waiting for him. And that as we fail in that, as we do it imperfectly, or sometimes as we boldly sin, that we be reminded all over again that we shouldn't trust the lie of the enemy that would try to incapacitate us because we're sinful. We should get back up, and because of the gospel goodness, the grace of God, that we can approach him with peace, we are to continue on with our mission as what we've been called to do. Too many times Christians fall down uh, wounded on the battlefield. I can't get back in. I can't get back into the battle. I've sinned. I have sinned. God wouldn't want me to be a part of ministry. God wouldn't want me to be a part of kingdom building. Uh, he wouldn't want me to be part of evangelism and discipleship. And he wouldn't, I, I'm too sinful for that. Of course you are. But Jesus appeared on our behalf before our Father in heaven. Don't let your failures keep you from being one of those who eagerly waits for him. Looks forward to the coming of Jesus by committing to the mission that he has commanded for us to be a part of. Go, make disciples, all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And Jesus promises, and surely I'll be with you to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I'm remembering all over again these many passages of the Bible that encourage us to look forward to the coming of Jesus, to stay busy with kingdom-building work until he comes, to, to spread the seed. We don't want to end our lives and stand before you with a bag full of seeds. And God says, why didn't you scatter these? Well, I gave you all of them. Why didn't you invest 
The talents in the parable of the talents. Why didn't you, why didn't you do all of the, the things that could have helped build this kingdom? Why would you not want to be wrung out for the spread of the gospel? Lord, I pray that we would be those who are eager in our waiting. Help us to be the kind of people who put our energies, our efforts, our attentions behind those things. Help us to not be so distracted by the world that we neglect to watch for you. Father, I pray that you'd also help us to not be so distracted by our own sins that we let those things keep us from doing kingdom building work. Lord, I pray that you would give a kind of moxie to the Christians in this congregation that when we sin and then wake up the next morning very fresh in our mind, that sin, that stain, that, that guilt and shame from our sin, that we would let that be used as leverage for our sanctification to the pursuit of maximal holiness, kingdom-building efforts. Father, I pray that we'd be the kind of people who would really believe and preach your gospel, that we're not saved because of our good works, that we're not saved because you knew we'd become sinless once we believed, but that Jesus' once and for all death paid the penalty for our sins, that everyone who believes in him shall have eternal life. Father, I pray that that would be our gospel call to those of the nations, those of our neighbors in this very county. Help us to be the believers who are counted as those who eagerly wait for the return of your son. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.